So we're we're filming this, and uh, the thing is, this is an interesting Q and A because we kind of we can't really get into too many specifics. I don't think too many spoilers because I think a lot of people will watch this who have not seen the movie yet. So oh, well, there's like studio executives haven't seen the movie yet. Yeah, so you I, I guys, mean, I don't know. I, listen, I, guys, it's like you know everybody's kind of familiar with the you know the Groundhog Day you know uh, thematic approach. So I, I don't know that it's I think what you know, without without providing spoilers, it's it's kind of a it, it vacillates between him getting his head cut off and him having this kind of deep relationship with his son. So it's kind of a it's a bit of a of a, a groundhog. Can I just for one second, because uh, the 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 little boy who played my son in the movie is is my son in real life, and that's my son Rio. Where is he? Rio. Stand up, Rio. There he is. <laughs> Look at it's that his kid. First, it's his first movie, and here's a little bit of movie trivia. Carnahan here said, we want your son to play your son. I'm like, nope, not happening. <laughs> and uh, we sent him through the audition process, and we sent him to an acting coach, and I was like, he's definitely going to lose out. He's never going to. And there he is, and that was Rio Grillo. So. <laughs> By the way, there's the next Harrison Ford right there. Uh so let's just jump backwards and, and talk about where, I mean, it's a little generic, but where did the idea come from? What, what, how did this thing come together? Uh, there's a two really talented uh, uh, twin brothers named Chris and Eddie Borey who wrote a screenplay called Continue that I read and I kind of fell in love with. And I, and I saw kind of um, themes in it that I liked, and themes about, um, uh, I think this, you know, my own son and my kids and, and this idea of being an absentee father and these things, that not, not that I am, because my adult children are right over there. Uh, <laughs> and they were the cheering the loudest, so that's either a good sign or a bad sign. Uh, but they wrote a really interesting screenplay, and, uh, and, and I kind of took it and, and put my little zhuzh on it, for lack of a, of a better word. And, and they and, and literally wrote it kind of for Frank. And I remember him, <laughs> I gave it to him. And I think you're, you, you wound up like under some set of stairs in New York City reading the script, and he read it once sitting, and he called me back. He's like, dude, if we can do this. I mean, yeah. and this was, we shot screen tests eight years ago for this movie. For Sony. For, yeah, for Sony. No, for Fox. Fox, yeah. eight years ago. And then Joe and I had done a, a movie to get, then we started a company together. We did The Gray, and then we started a company together. And then we were like, let's go get, it was called Continue at the time. We said, let's go get that movie at a turnaround, which is at yeah. the studio. And that was the nightmare that began this, this, this film. Yeah. And it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. Yeah. I think that, and I could be wrong about this, but I think the thing that's going to shock people more than anything is uh, reveal how many shooting days you had to pull this off. That was shot in 27 days, guys. Well, it was originally 41 40, days. No, it was 43. 43. So they cut because, and again... A, uh, a lot of you, I'm sure, are filmmakers out here. And, and, and again, I'd like to tell you guys it's going to get easier. And you're not going to deal with assholes and liars and thieves. But the fact of the matter is I'd be lying and an asshole and a thief if I told you <laughs> anything else. Uh, we, we just uh, wound up in a situation where, uh, you know, some people want to make some money. And, and they use this as a way to, to kind of make the film, make the money. And listen, all this, I'm, I'm saying this is kind of... Uh, 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 anecdotally, it doesn't matter because I made that film and I'm hugely proud of that film. And whatever happened, happened. And uh, but it was, it, you know, we got we got our days. We got 15 days cut out of the budget because while we were yeah. in Atlanta and we had hired 300 people to work on the film with us, you know, uh, and and uh, while we were there prepping the film, we had a phone call from our uh, financiers who said, "Well, the movie's not 43 days anymore; it's 27." So you can either tell everyone they're fired, and you can send them home. These are people who work for a living. Or you can figure out 27 days. So him and I went, we were living together in a house, and we just kind of- Which we'll never do again. Which we'll never do again. And for 48 hours, with about 48 bottles of wine, 
we figured out how to shoot a 43-day movie in 27 days, and we saved 300 jobs. And by the way, there's another, there's a, there's another gentleman in this audience that deserves a big round of applause, Scott Putnam. Scott Where Putnam. Are you, Without Where's Scott? Scott Putnam, Where's Scott? Uh, he's our... There he is, right there. He's the, he's the other guy, member of War Party. That, yeah. that man is, yeah. uh, is a saint he's and, a bri- uh, brilliant, and literally brilliant a, a, a brilliant man and, and yeah. bailed us out and, and really helped us out and, uh, and is our compadre, and, and we may hopefully we never make a film without him again. But... Yeah. Uh, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, you know, I could bitch and moan all, all night as he could, but listen, it is what it is. I'm, I'm deeply proud of the film as he is. And so, uh, that's the way it is. And this is just the stuff you're going to encounter guys. And, and you gotta, you have to overcome it. I, I truly in, in, I've seen a lot of movies. I don't think I've ever seen a movie with this much action shot in 27 days. Like, how the F did you actually pull it off? Well, I have to say one thing. And, and, and by the way, this guy's amazing. And I, a little piece of me dies to say that because he's also my best friend and partner. And it kills me that he's amazing. But I don't know how he did it. And I'll tell you one better. Mel Gibson, who made Braveheart and, you know, little movies like that, is, is fascinated by Joe Carnahan. He's become a pal and we're about to do another movie with him. And every time we see him, his question to Joe is, so tell me how you made that movie in 27 days. So I don't even know that he knows how he did it, but, but uh, you know, by the, by the graces of God, he, pu- he, he pulled it off. He, you know, it, it really was him. He was the captain. And we just kind of you know, fell lockstep into what he was doing, Scott yeah, yeah, and I. Yeah, and- I, I could say this hand on heart. I never want to fucking do that again. It was, uh, it, was, it was the most painful experience. It was, listen, it was one of those things where you know, you just look at yourself in the mirror and you go, okay, okay, what are you about today? And, and, and you have to figure these things out. The brilliant thing about it was, I think the very liberating thing about it was, was I didn't have time to say, let's do take five or take six. I had to figure out a shot. And if you notice, there's a lot of, you know, the whole thing where he pulls his tooth out, that's one shot. Um, uh, so I went to school on the, you know, David Lean, Steven Spielberg, you know, okay, how am I going to pull this off? And, and, and uh, so th- that was... Uh, which I think, listen, at the end of the day, is, is ultimately the, the best kind of filmmaking because it really um, it, it focuses you and it makes you make kind of harsh decisions about uh, the creative aspect of the stuff. But yeah, uh, you can't be egregious with no, your, 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 but, you know, your process. Your process, yeah. yeah. It doesn't exist. So your that process. was, and that was, I think, I guess, very freeing, you know, is to not have to, uh, I didn't have the time. We just had to figure it out in the moment. And, uh, and so you start to, it's like they used to say Ted Williams could see the, 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 the seams on a, on a curveball, and that's how I felt for 27 days. I never want to do that again, ever, but, uh, but I'm glad I did. Well, the thing that you have is you have a, 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 you're, you're repeating a lot of the same moments. So talk a little bit about trying to balance where the F your head is in each scene and, try, and, and talk about, like, for example, let's talk about the opening. You're in the condo, the apartment, if you will. How, how, many, how many days did you get to shoot that scene and keeping track of everything, you know? Yeah, three days. Three days, yeah. Three days. And there's a lot, believe it or not, that's not the same scene over and over again. That's a different scene over and over again. It was, it was nuanced. I mean, there was a, there's a, there's a, it was a lot of physical stuff, too. So I, I, there, there was no, like, third take. It was like, and he knew that I knew what I was, I was prepared. And so... And I was physically prepared, and I, I, there wasn't anything about Roy that I wasn't that we couldn't just on 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 a nickel do something else because we were that we were we were overly prepared, and that's what yeah. And by the way, Frank is like half his size as he was in the film. I think he was like deadlifting like six hundred and sixty <laughs> pounds or some crazy like. So he was, but but it's also like that whole shot where he goes and sits down as his apartment's being. That was a motion control rig. We had to steal. We lied to them and said we needed it for something else. We needed it for the helicopter coming through the thing, and, we, and we, we lied to them so we could shoot those scenes. They were not boarded. We just didn't have the time. to. Do, we, we, we knew if we, if we told them, if we put it on the schedule, that they would say no. So we just lied and stole those shots, and, <laughs> and, and that's what you had to do. But, again, it was, it was, I think it was a, a, a level of preparation being surrounded by guys, like, like again, like... Uh, like Scott and and and, uh, and people that really kind of were pulling for the process that uh, that knew what we were up to and, and supported it. I, I don't want to get into 
uh, specifics, again, because I want to avoid spoilers, but there is some real hand-to-hand -hand combat that you have to do in the third act involving gunfire, stairs. How, again, how did you guys pull this off with the time frame? Well, I'll tell you, there wasn't a lot of time for preparation in any of that stuff. Uh, you know, we didn't know we had the guys until the very end because we were underfunded. Like, it was a constant battle just to keep, Scott can tell you, just to keep the movie afloat week by week. We, and we were, along with Scott, we were boots on the ground producers. We were making the movie, the three of us. So there was nobody else. So uh, along with, with being the director and the writer and the actor in the film, we had to produce the movie with Scott. By, by the way, there were 26 other producer credits, but there were three guys right. actually making the film. <laughs> right. So I, you know, it's, it, it's kind of a testament to kind of being physically prepared as well. You know, that whole sword fight with Michelle Yeoh, what did we do that in? Uh, I think you learned that in like, in like a, I, think, I think he learned that sword fight in two hours. Yeah. It was like two hours. And then Glenice Mullins, who's here, who's one of our editors, is right there, who cut that scene. Yeah. God bless her. Uh, it's a brilliant scene. Uh, I think she took, he learned it in two hours. It took her two weeks to cut that scene. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah. that's how it works. Yeah. You guys had a great supporting cast. Uh, and you shot in Atlanta, I believe? Yeah, correct. Uh, so how did you pull this all together in terms of the schedule, the budget, you know, getting Mel, getting all the other names? I mean, you know, listen, uh, Will Sasso, I'd been a fan of for a long time, and I always thought uh, funny guys can be also very menacing guys, and he just has, he's a brilliant kind of Im improvisatory uh, uh, guy, uh, and I thought he'd be a good kind of foil for, you know, for Mel. Uh, l let's talk about Mel for a moment. Like, there wasn't a, he did not take like, he took it so... By the way, he dislocated Frank's jaw during that fight scene. Yeah. Uh, literally. You know who doesn't know how to fight? Mel Gibson. <laughs> yeah, we had that fight, and I said, hey, Mel, we're going to do this thing. I said, you're going you're gonna to come across me. Be careful you don't hit me in the chin and with he's got your like elbow. those Popeye and forearms. He was, and, yeah, and he's, and he's like, oh, well, I don't know. I go, wait a minute, you're brave for it. What do you mean you don't fucking know? <laughs> you're Mel Gibson. He goes, no, no I, I don't do this fighting. I don't know. And I go, Mel, just don't, because I'm going to come in. So you got to make sure that you pull. The first take, he elbowed me so hard in the jaw that this went over there. And for three days, you know, there's a woman who comes and she sticks her fingers in your mouth and she jabs her finger in your jaw so that you can speak. And that's what I did for three days. And Mel would come over and, you know, we were like, don't upset Mel, don't, don't upset Mel. And Mel would come over and go, are you okay? I'm oh, fine. It's fine. I, I'm, I'm drinking, I'm eating through a straw, but it's, it's going to be fine, Mel. It's good. Yeah. Uh, no, but we had, you know, Selena Lowe is fantastic as Guan Yin. I mean, she's, you know, there's like, we, we really had some extraordinary. Naomi Watts. Uh, Naomi Watts. Uh, uh, we, yeah, we had some really wonderful uh, people. The script. Uh, I'm tell you, but I'll tell you what attracts actors. Scripts, right? Scripts and directors. And, and at the end of the day, you know, his body of work speaks for itself. And if you see the actors that he's attracted in all his films, and all great actors, you know, Liam, the Liam Neeson's of the world, and it goes on and on and on. It's, the script attracts the actors. And, and uh, he wrote a great script, he was directing it, and, you know, they, it wasn't really difficult to get them. It, re it really wasn't. And uh, they were gung-ho. They, they loved the idea of what this was. So that was, that was the one easy thing, is that all the actors were in. Uh, I'm always fascinated about the editing process because that's the you know, final rewrite. I would imagine you did not have a lot of deleted scenes. No. I think we had, there's one, there's two scenes. They're both Mel, but there's a scene with Naomi uh, that we deleted. It was about a, um, God, it was about a three and a half minute scene where she's in his office there. And we... As much as we love the scene, we're like, it just, it's not, it's, we need to kind of keep the movie going. Because we don't want you guys to sit, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, we just wanted to, it was all, it's propulsion based. Action films are very much propulsion based and, and you got to kind of keep everybody, you know, engaged. So, no, there's, when you have 27 days, uh, no, there's no deleted scenes. <laughs> You, you talk, and again, I'm, I'm, this is so tricky with the, trying to avoid spoilers, but you, in the film, there, it is explained how uh, Frank is able to 
have these things happening to him. How much were you talk, thinking about you know, the full explanation of that and getting into the nitty gritty and how much is it sort of like, you know, towing that balance of explaining? Yeah, listen, I, you know, my movies have been like, you know, Narc and Smoking Aces and The Grey. I don't know shit about sci-fi, you know. Uh, I don't. And, and the stuff that I um, respond to, on the, like, I guess, in the sci-fi front, like, I love what Ryan did with Looper because it was kind of, I just got it. You know, there was something grounded about it. So and you believe you, you, you yeah. listen, you if you're gonna buy into it, you just have to suspend this. Yeah, point. listen, if you show up and, and and you're gonna bitch and moan about uh, us doing like Groundhog Day, you should probably fuck off and leave because it's probably not the movie for you. You know what I mean? So if I have to sit here and, and, and become Isaac Asimov, you're gonna be disappointed. You know, it just doesn't you know, so I think it was more of uh, simply uh, here's what we're doing. Uh, this guy's, I think what I, what the conceit that I liked was you're not like these, unlike these other kind of uh, repetitive kind of time uh, uh, loop uh, movies, he's not discovering it. You kind of meet him and he's kind of bored by the whole thing because it's been happening to him so much. I like that aspect of it. This kind of, uh, oh shit, he's, he's, he's kind of a bum. It doesn't really know what to do. And he just goes and gets drunk until he gets killed, you know. And by the way, that'd be me, you know. That's kind of me. So I think it was more about that and then kind of weaving in this idea that you could take his blood and hair and kind of make his DNA uh, the kind of the mass in this missing. But it's funny. We, <laughs> I got to tell the story. We had a moment. Frank and I were going to do this movie. It was a big Chinese company. And uh, they said, uh, yeah, you guys are calling it a collider. It's not a collider. And I go, no, I know. It's a, it's a time machine. They go, yeah. So uh, let's call it a time machine. I go, yeah, but they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't say time machine. They would say something else. They go, yeah, it's a time machine. They go, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay. We wind up getting this big argument, but it's this weird kind of stasis where they don't want to say call it a time machine. So I say, okay, what if we call it a quantum displacement engine? And they go, that's great. He made that up. I just made it up. Just made it up. Just fucking made it up. You know. I so, have, it, by the way, it's like the Stephen King thing. All that shit's made up. You just make stuff up. I, I gotta, I gotta stop and say that I really wish it was called the Collider. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there you go. I know. There you go for selfish reasons. Right. Exactly. Um, so you, you're getting ready. Which, which ended up being the biggest pain in the ass to film, and why in the film? Which one of being? What was the biggest pain in the ass? Yeah, the thing that you were like, we're never getting through this. Oh, this is just the people that we had to make the film with. No, it's true. No. I no, mean, because every these week... These guys were brilliant. Listen, every week on, on a movie, you make an independent film, and every week on Friday, they fund you, right? It's not like they give you the $25 million in an account, and they go, hey, go make your movie. It's like every week they fund you. And say they're supposed to give you a million dollars a week to pay everyone and to prepare, and, and we would get 400000 And we'd go, uh oh, uh, uh-oh. What do we do? And then, and Scott can attest to this, at least four times we had to call the crew together and say, well, there's not quite enough to pay everybody, but if you could wait till Monday or Tuesday, it would be awesome. You know, if you're in it with us, great. If not, we get that too. If anybody wants to walk, we understand. We'll, we'll, we'll pay you. No one left. Not one person left. Right, Scott? Did anyone? No one left. No. Because every week we sat with them. We said, hey, the jerk offs aren't paying us again. This is what we got to do. And, uh, you know, we, we had full transparency and everybody was treated with respect. Again, we learned a valuable lesson. And it's like, if you want to, if you, it's about making the people feel good about what they're doing. And that's what, you know, that was the biggest hurdle making the movie. Everything else. Yeah, and kinda, also they were seeing dailies. They knew it wasn't, you know, they knew it was working. It was funny. Like it wasn't, uh, I think they didn't feel they were giving their time to this kind of empty, you know, venture that was uh, bullshit. No one was going to see it. I think they thought, okay, you know, and, and, and I think, again, Frank and I being on the front line because the other people that were quote-unquote producers on this film never showed up. They showed up for about two hours to take a picture of Mel Gibson on Instagram and then they disappeared, which is true. Um, uh, you know, and it's like, but again, this is just the reality of making movies, guys. You're going to deal with these people. Like, they, they have access to money. And so... Part of us, and, and, and by the way, uh, Frosty letting us come out here and show this movie to you, 
is in an effort to avoid winding up on, on streaming, that it's just a movie that just kind of disappeared because they didn't have the support it needed to play theatrically, and that's simply not the case. So we are in this position because of these, uh, I'm not gonna call them nefarious, but let's say ne'er-do-wells that, that, that did what they did. Uh, I'm not gonna bitch and moan about it now, nor is Frank, we made this movie, we're exceedingly proud of this film, but this is where we're at, and this is kind of what you deal with, and uh, to work outside the studio system, because um, this movie doesn't get made in the studio. Listen, any more than Smoke and Aces gets made, there's no fucking way they green like that film in this day and age. It's just not gonna happen. So you have to understand that and you have to either adapt to that and, and do what we did uh, or not make films. And I, and I choose to make films. Uh, was there... Did that seem bitter? Was that... I, I just, as I, as I stopped talking, he, he I thought... Is, he is now also in therapy, so it's getting better and better. <laughs> I thought that was a little bitter. Was there anything... How did the story or script change? So you go from 43 days to 27. Is it one of these things where you're like, okay, we just have to figure out how to film this script in 27 days? Well, Brad Pitt was playing my role, so we just had, we, we couldn't. We would have gotten 88 yeah. million dollars <laughs> yeah, we to do that anyway. Whatever. Uh, no, I'll give you an example. So we had at the end, uh, we called the jam room. Sky, remember this? It was the Jamiroquai. We were going to do a fight scene and use the old uh, 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 Jamiroquai video where everything moves except you know all this you know and have this big fight between Roy and all the assassins. And we're like, and they came back, and it's like, it's, a, it's five days to shoot that. And so they go, you gotta figure something else out. And it was literally like, oh, there's a, there's a machine gun in the helicopter. Uh, I'm just gonna have him shoot everybody. <laughs> and that's literally how it went down. And it worked, you know. It's like, if you don't, now you guys know, and you could be assholes about it, and go, well, they didn't shoot the fight scene, they did they? But if you don't know what's there, it's, it's uh, you don't miss it, you know. I think, I think that uh, Tim Miller on Deadpool had his budget cut a little bit, and that's why Deadpool, at the end of the movie, forgets why he forgot all the guns, because they didn't have the budget for it. Something like that. Is that true? They really? do now. Right. Oh, yeah, they, yeah, they do now. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's true. In, I mean, people come up with stuff when, you know, when your back is against the wall. And, and a lot of times it's better. It gets, gets better. Listen, it's the, it's the, we used it in the movie. The, it's, the, it's the indie fighting the swordsman. You know, it's like, okay, he had, he had dysentery or whatever Harrison Ford had. You know, it's like, you hear all these stories. And, and I, remember me, I remember talking to Harrison Ford. He's like, yeah, I was sick. I didn't want to, I just took out the gun and shit. And everybody laughed. And as soon as that happened, it's like, oh, there goes the fight. So it, these things are necessary sometimes. You, you, you have to be kind, of, you have to have your back to the wall to figure out what you can really do. And I encourage all of you that are filmmakers, you're going to, you're going to get put in this corner, whether you want to or not. Uh, you're going to get put in this corner, and you're going to have to you're going to have to fight your way out, or think your way out, or a combination of the two. As a New England Patriots fan, I know I'm going to get some booze. Um, oh no, they're great, <laughs> bro. Uh, it's cool to see Gronk. As the if people don't realize, it's Gronk who is doing the machine gun on the helicopter. Uh, so talk a little bit of the former tight end of the New England Patriots. He's kind of good. Uh, just throwing he's that out. He's a Hall of Famer. But yeah, yeah, he's unbelievable. Um, how did Gronk end up in this movie? Because I believe when you guys were filming, I saw a video of you training him how to yeah, do that. Yeah, I, I never had an Instagram post have more likes or reposts than, than, than Gronk shooting that weapon, which was a terrifying... Uh, the fact that that was shooting blanks, but that was actually a working weapon. Uh, I think they were... It was six bucks a bullet. So, yeah, that gasp is, yeah, absolutely. That's how I felt. Uh, it, so he, and this is a guy who's, you know, six, 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 seven, whatever it was, and he had to literally, like, hold himself in place and let, and let this thing go, and it's like, so it was, he, he was like, by the way, and, we, and I, I was, I just, I love the idea. I'm a big football fan, so I love the idea of Gronkowski being in the film. And uh, uh, Sherry Thomas, who's one of the casting, is the biggest Patriots fan on the planet. So when he showed up, they didn't tell her he was coming. And she lost her mind. Like, they filmed that she lost her mind when Gronkowski showed up. But he was also one of the loveliest, like, he's sweetest good. guys. He's a big like, kid. He's a big kid. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and he was really good. He was, like, he was perfect for that. And then the other guys, the, the German twins, were Rashad Evans, 
and Rampage Jackson, who were both former, and they fought each other in the UFC. They were both world champions. And uh, Rampage was in the A-team for me and, yeah. and a dear friend, and I adore him. And, and those guys were enemies, and we thought, you know, they should, they should play. They should play brothers. Yeah, the German twins. And Michelle Yeoh, the great Michelle Yeoh, who's a legend. Yeah, it was some great we people. We had Michelle Yeoh for one day. Yeah. One day. It, I, I still don't get it, like how you did it. And by the way, that scene where she's training Frank, that was a one-walled set. That was it. I had one wall to shoot that on. Yeah. That's okay. Your applause are appreciated. And you should <laughs> encourage it. There you go. Let that become infectious. I appreciate that. So the most takes you did in the movie was? Six. And what scene? I think uh, maybe you chopping Mr. Good Morning up. Yeah. Because it was a very intricate, but that was it. Like that was it. You just didn't have the. You just didn't have the. You just couldn't. I mean, we just didn't have the bandwidth. So I would imagine there's a lot of people who are going to watch this or hear about the screening that are going to want to see the movie. Uh, is is there a plan for a trailer being released? Is there a plan yes. for? Yes. Yeah. The, this movie's been sold internationally, so all over the world, in in all the territories where people see movies, this movie's already been sold, and they all can release the movie actually when they want to. Uh, and there's an international poster and there's an international trailer. The one thing that's holding us up is our domestic distribution. And we're in the process, like right now, of, of still kind of securing that and making sure that we get the proper release. Uh, otherwise, as Joe said, you know, like many movies today, they, they, get, they wound up on the streaming services. And uh, that's great if, you know, Joe and I have made two movies for Netflix. And it's great if you make the movie for the streaming service, but you don't want your film, which is the theatrical film, to end up on a streaming service and have no domestic distribution. So that's kind of where we are right now. And that's, listen, that is the, the challenge of being, making independent movies. It really is. And as big as the movie looks at times, it's an independent film. It's a, it's a small independent film. And, uh, you know, finding domestic distribution is, there's a lot of movies that, you hear about that go to Venice Film Festival in Toronto and Tribeca and Sundance and they're great and everybody goes, yay, and no one buys them. Yeah. No one sees them. And I also think that's an absolute movie star performance by that man to my right, Mr. Frank Grillo. Oh, thank you. abso fucking <laughs> Thank you. I think there's not many guys who could do what he did in this film, and I think that's, that's a testament to, to, again, to him. And, you know, listen, I, I'm now... Uh, I, I find myself writing for him, even if I'm writing something he's not supposed to be in. I find myself <laughs> writing for him. So uh, that's the other thing. It's like, listen, uh, people don't want to roll the dice, and uh, the studios don't want to take a shot. And, and I don't blame them. But but uh, it's a tough business. It you is. Know? You look at this weekend, this movie, Birds of Prey, which is, has all the elements, and it should have been a big hit, and, and it kind of wasn't. It, you know, it kind of it's it's what they consider a failure, and that's a scary. It's a scary thing for studios when, when you have all the elements that, are, you know, I've been in Marvel movies and it's kind of, they, they know it's going to be successful. They know. They know. And, uh, oh boy, do they know. Yeah. And that's probably the only studio that knows because the rest of it is, is a gamble. Yeah, it is. And it's scary. Unlike a movie that I wrote, Bad Boys for Life, which whatever, was, uh, there you know, you go. number one for three weeks in a row. Yeah. It's not a big deal. It's not a big, no, no, no. It's okay. You don't have to clap. No, but listen, I didn't know that that was going to do that. I had no idea. I actually, I have a few other questions for you guys, and the first thing is, are you surprised? Because Bad Boys for Life came out of nowhere to be, number, as you said, number one for three weeks in a row. Yeah. I'm and not Yeah, I'm not, No, I'm not Frank, you know what's crazy? Nope. He, he, he said to me, it's going to make a lot of money, and I was yep. like, I don't know. It's Will Smith. But you know what's best. crazy? Uh, uh, it, it, it patched up all of our wayward uh, relationships. Everybody texts everybody. It's like, love you, bro. Love you, man. <laughs> Great. <laughs> we did it. You know, so... Uh, it worked, man, and I'm and I'm thrilled, and uh, and you never know. But he he told me it's gonna work. I was like, I, I had no idea. Uh, I've asked you guys this question for at least 17 years, <laughs> and I'm gonna ask it again. Uh, you guys have the rights to the raid, or do you not have the rights to the raid? No, we do. We, we well, yeah. well, well. Here, here's we have the, the rights to our version. Our ver we, sure. we we have we own the script. The, yeah. the, the, the script that, that we wrote, that we have. That our script is way cooler. It's our script, and we, we, we parted ways with XYZ, who owns the title, but not the script. We own the script. 
and we are right now negotiating with. It's, a, it's pretty sexy right now. Yeah, with a yeah. with a big name, uh, and it would be. Do we have another name that we love that's going to play. Who's going to play guy. the bad guy? And we, so we're assembling this movie to be. We're going to do a movie called Leo from Toledo with another Mel Gibson movie. Uh, there you go. Myself and Mel. There you go. Yeah. That show's going to direct. And then uh, hopefully uh, our movie, um, which is not called The Raid, but it's the same script, um, will be after that. With and guys, really this is a clarification. Uh, the, the version that I wrote, they don't ever intend to actually go in. They think that they're going to move this guy. So their whole operation is... We're gonna hit this guy in transit, and it's not until they realize, oh, they're digging in. They're not. They're not moving. We've got to now go in and get them. For those who know the raid. For those th those that know the raid, um, uh, it's a very, very different script. Yeah, um, the bones uh, of it. The bones. There's a similar story inside of it, but uh, but but it's really, really, really about the brothers. It's, it's about not, the two brothers. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's me and Brad Pitt. Anyway, no, no. <laughs> I'm obsessed now with Brad Pitt. I don't know. But Frank goes blonde, which is really, really something to see. I'll go blonde for Brad Pitt. Do you guys have a new title for this script? It's called Brad Pitt. <laughs> Bra Brad Pitt. It's actually Brad Pitt's raid. Right. That's, that's what we're calling We're raiding Brad Pitt. <laughs> is Brad here? <laughs> I, actually uh, do, I actually do love Brad Pitt. <laughs> Does, does it have a, a title, or are you figuring it out? Zeno. That's what it's called, which is the character's name. It's called Zeno. 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 That's, that's, his, that's the, the main character's name. X-E-Z-O? Z-E-N-O. I don't, can't spell. It's English. It's okay. is no, you language. can't. No, you're really... It's called you, Zeno. Oh, yeah. You're really is terrible. That but X? <laughs> Listen. I've no, been, that's what's called right I've now. I've been drinking. I do... Hey, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm joking. You and me around. both, pal. I'm joking. Uh, no, spelling and me are not but good friends. So you're, you're getting ready to do Leo from Toledo. Yeah. Right. So when are you filming this? Uh, in about uh, filming it in about a month, seven and a weeks. Half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, eight weeks. Is there like a log line you can share? Yeah, Mel plays a guy who is suffering from a kind of waking dementia, uh, which is he blacks out, but he's he's conscious, he's awake, and then he just loses time. So it's written in the script that he just loses time, which is kind of great if you're. Screener, I could go, I don't know how to get past this bullshit. Oh, he'll just black out. <laughs> uh, and he basically is living as this guy named Leo Ward, and he has a encounter with these uh, kind of local, let's call them local toughs, and he wakes up in the hospital, and his girlfriend, who's a sheriff, is staring at him, and he's handcuffed, and he rolls his the admittance bracelet over, and he's... It says Conrad Varick, and Conrad Varick was his name when he was a hitman for the Kansas City mob, and he's in witness protection now, and he's just given up the ghost. So they know he's alive. They're coming for him. It's Mel Gibson as, like, Martin Riggs in his 60s with me and, Fra and Frank playing a Anderson Cooper-like hitman. <laughs> to, to come and get him. Yes. And, and By the way, I'm saying that so Frank commits to looking like an Anderson Cooper-like hitman. It's on right there, bro. No, they're right filming there. it. No, I want to look exactly like And when like he gives it. me shit, I'm going to go, remember? No, no. We were at the screening, I'm gonna, I'm and I said Anderson Cooper. <laughs> I, he's handsome. I like Anderson Cooper. Just almost as much as Brad. Silver hair. Yeah. So you got, uh, where are you guys filming this? Uh, is anybody from Ohio? Scott, where are we filming this? Ohio or Louisiana. Ohio or Louisiana. And you have more than 27 days? No. Uh, 26. <laughs> Do you How have, many days, no, Scott? I'm kidding. Scott. 35? We have 30. Yeah, but it's much... We have 30, dude. Come it's, on. It's not as much action. Uh, so getting back... So the plan would be Leo, God willing, Z Zeno. Zeno, <laughs> with an X. Right. Uh, and uh, I'll never live this we'll one talk. down. No, we'll talk after. And, and, uh, right. No, so... But you guys also were producing other stuff, and you have other... What else is coming up for you guys in terms of War Party? Uh... We have a script called Graves that we're very excited about, which is basically Serpico and Poltergeist, where the cop car is the haunted house, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, this thing called Pound for Pound, which is kind of an MMA Rocky type thing. Uh, Thorn, which we're going to, I can't tell you who's 
attached to a it. Or very attached big to it. woman, but a, movie star. but a, but it's but it's something I wrote that I'm pretty excited about that we're gonna do. Uh, listen, you know, and we're just trying to slowly kind of plod forward and, and do our stupid little shit, and uh, and we we're not really in the we're not really in the you know over twenty million dollar. We're just not. It's just not. Although they're trying to drag us into that world. Yeah. We're just Our not. mission statement was not to make movies over 20 million bucks. And, and when you go and sit down with the studios, which Joe and I often have to go and sit with studio heads or, you know, the streaming companies, and you, know, uh, and you were like, well, you know, we, look, we have this thing for 15 million bucks. Like, hey, what do you have for 35 million? Yeah. I'm like, oh. I mean, we, we just we saw the company, Frank's like, they want to make movies between 30 and 80 million bucks. I'm like, why? I know. Why? I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know. I don't know. They don't want to pay us, but they no. want to make the movies yeah. for thirty. Yeah. Million. You know, they don't want to pay Brad Pitt. They want to give him twenty. I would pay Brad Pitt. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there was talk about doing another thing of Wheelman or Wheelman. Yeah, Wheelman was our first movie together that we, as a company, right, we made it for five million bucks, and we did an early screening of that at ArcLight yeah. Sherman Oaks, yes. and I yeah. was very, very thankful we that, did that. That's a good little movie. That's a movie. That, there's a testament to 19 days. And Joe nurtured this young writer, not so young actually, and, and gave him notes. And after a month, this script, he gave me the script. I'm like, this is amazing. We can do this for five million bucks. We gave it to CAA. They took it to Cannes the next day to sell it internationally to raise the money. And Netflix swooped in and bought the script. And they made this kid who directed the movie, Jeremy Rush, he got signed by CAA. And now he gets movie offers that from the studios from that movie. Yeah, because so never give up. Well, he never did a great job with it. Yeah, it's yeah. true. Yeah, but, but I, I could be wrong about this, but I thought there was talk about doing like another Wheel Man, or or am I wrong about this? No, we uh, we, we want you yeah. know we wanted to, but, but it's Jeremy, man. It's, we can't get him off his butt. Yeah. yeah, guys, if you know Jeremy Rush, hopefully I'm gonna stare right into the camera when I'm saying this because it's gonna be a quieter. Jeremy, what the fuck are we doing? Come on, man, make Wheel Man too. Do Wheel Man too. Yeah. No, you know, he's, listen, he's a very, uh, the guy's an artist, man. He wants but to he was he a PA. You guys know what a PA is, right? Production system, for those who aren't in the business. And he was basically, you know, shepherding actors from their trailers to the set. And he's been writing this script for like years. And he sent it to, sent, he was friends with Chris Pine and Joe's friends with Chris Pine and sent him the script on a cold call. And Joe read it and gave him notes. And that happened for like a month. And, we went and made his movie within two months. This was a guy knocking on actors' doors, and now he is a director at CAA. And he made a great movie, and man. He made a great and, movie. And by the way, that when I look at that film, I go, "That's that's Jeremy's movie, man." I, we we, uh, I'm very proud of that. I, film. Listen, I would do that all day, every day. If I could just make movies like that, I would do it all day, every day. That's what I want to do. I, you know, listen. So, guys, if you got a script, yeah. Frank's gonna take. Send, send it to me. It to him. And, uh, on his way, on your way out, just yeah. give him your script. Yeah, be like don't, the rest of my shy. family. Be like the rest of my family <laughs> in New York who somehow became screenwriters, all of them. I got an idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually want to do one more question on boss level, which is, I want to talk about you actually working with your son, who I think is still here. I think he might have left because it's bedtime. Yeah, I was going to be like, it's pretty Rio late. left. Yeah. Rio so left. so my, my thing, though, is what is it like working with your son and, you know, what is it like directing his son? You know, there has to be a, a little bit of a different dynamic. Oh, listen, man. I, listen, he, he tried to sabotage me. He didn't want Rio to do the movie. So, he, like, I found out late. He was like, Frank's like, I, I, I got to tell you, I told Sharon Bialy, don't, we, we can't, we, he can't be in the movie. Because no. I, I looked at, because by the way, I'd known Rio since he's a baby. By the way, he looks like an angel, right? He looks like his mother and his father put together, which are both beautiful people. So, he's this angel. And he's got this great little raspy voice. And I knew, and by the way, Frank has to tell the story when, when they were like, Frank's like, at some point, this little fucker's trying to upstage me. He was. He was fucking, <laughs> I swear to God, he was upstaging me. And I'd be, every minute I'd be like, are you okay, buddy? Are you? He's like, dad, dad, I'm concentrating. Stop asking me if I'm okay. I'm like, all right, you little fuck. I'm just trying to help you out. Like, take it easy. And Joe would throw him lines, like, you know, wild lines. And, and, and I'd go, okay, so bud, what? he goes, dad, I'm talking to the director. And then we'd be like, in the scenes where we were walking and talking, oh, and we were walking and talking, he'd be like moving ahead of me so the camera would be on him. And I'm like, hey, dude, move the fuck back. Like, move back. You're like upstaging me. He's like, well, Dad, you got to walk faster. 
And, As he said, walk faster. And, and all he wanted to know was when he was going to be on IMDb. <laughs> now he wants to know if, if I can introduce him, and I'm not joking, to Steven Spielberg. <laughs> yeah, I hate that kid. <laughs> but I also think it's like, listen, I knew there's a certain kind of, for, for, you, for the audience to buy into the film, uh, the chemistry that a father's going to have with his son. And, and I have, listen, I, I, my, my boy's here somewhere. My son, Rockney, and my daughter, Miley, who I love very dearly. There they are. Uh, and a lot of this is, I wrote this for those guys. I wrote this for my kids, you know. It's like, it's my, it's my uh, pain to, you know, thinking I was there, maybe not being there, maybe whatever. But, like, um, that connection is, is, is so important. And I didn't want, I wanted to avoid, him, like, pairing him with, like, you know, precocious, pain-in-the-ass child actor who's, you know, who can hit these cues, but it doesn't feel real. And I knew that him and Rio together, there'd be an undeniable kind of chemistry, and it works, man. You could see it. It just, it absolutely works. It's like he's talking to his boy, and there's some, there's an indelible thing that happens. There's a, there's a remarkable thing that happens. There's an undeniable thing that happens when you're talking about, when you're looking at something that you created. It, it's, you know. It, the, the thing is, when I'm looking at him, as, as the character, I'm discovering my son, because I don't know my son, so I'm getting to discover him. So all of that, that, that beautiful discovery, for me, is watching my son act in real life. And I'd be watching him like, this son of a bitch, it's taken me 45 years to get a job. <laughs> this fucking kid, he just, I mean, he's, he's nine years old. How did he do it? <laughs> And I'm discovering him and falling, and so it was really, it was really an interesting. He was right. I mean, he was 100 percent right again. If he kills me, I don't know. If fucking, where's Brad Pitt? What was the last big fight you two had? Me and him? Yeah. <laughs> we don't fight. We don't fight. No, you don't. No, we can't talk about the last big fight we had. The, I had one. By the way, the one, the one disagreement he and I said when we were doing the tooth pulling scene because I think we were both so stressed out, and I, we went outside and I said nothing we're doing is working. Nothing we're doing in this scene is working. And I walked away, and I never said another thing. The next take that Frank did was in the movie. That was so... We don't, we don't fight. No, we don't. We don't fight. We make yeah. fun of each other, but we don't <laughs> fight. We, we can't. No, no, it's we too, don't. There's too much of a we short. We fight with everybody else. We fight with everybody else. We want to kill everybody else, but not each other. Yeah. Uh, I think this might, one of, might be my last question for you, Joe. Do you miss Twitter? Do I miss Twitter? Yeah. No. Jesus Joe Christ. Joe's Twitter punished. By the way, uh, those of you who follow my Twitter, it's weird that, that six months would pass and I, would, I wouldn't get a single follower. And by the way, can I look right in the camera? Jack Dorsey, you're a fascist little motherfucker. And he, I hope you go down. <laughs> there you go. There's some, yeah. Yeah, Jack, you hear that? They're clapping because you're a scumbag. There you go. No, I, you know what? It's better for me, man. It I'd is, rather it I should is. do the New York Times crossword puzzle and read CNN and... Yeah. Stay off of that yeah. bullshit. Yeah. Uh, Frank's on Instagram. He's got a lot of followers. So yeah. I, I can't even, I'm not even on Instagram. Because I'm I nice. I can't log into my account. That's what a moron I am. I can't even get on my account. Good. My kids don't help me. They don't give a shit. They want me off. They want me just to be like in the Stone Age. Right, kids? You've won. You've won, guys. Um, on that note, I'm going to say uh, a huge thank you to Arclight Cinemas. Yes. For, Thanks, guys. For Love partnering it. up. And guys... It means a lot that you guys came out, man. I, I really can't tell you thank how you much. so much. Tremendous, thank fantastic, so, and I hope you enjoyed the film. And if you didn't, uh, please don't fucking say that. But if you did enjoy it, <laughs> blow it up. I really appreciate it, guys. Yeah, I was going to say that if you enjoyed if you enjoyed the movie, please uh, talk about it socially. Just don't write any reviews. Uh, Joe and Frank, thank you so much for oh, showing thank the movie you, brother. and for the Q and A. Thank you, Bubba.